broadcasting worldwide from a studio inside global headquarters of RP Enterprises in Kansas City. Hey, gang. Ladies and gentlemen, Papa's home. This is the Papa Ron Podcast. File transfer in progress. With Ronnie Phillips and Jillian Gray. Showtime. You know, I got a notification from Spotify last week that it is the one year anniversary of the Papa Ron podcast. Can't believe it. We're into 30s, uh, episode 37, which means we weren't able to do an episode every single week. Of course, that was the objective and the goal, but I still think 37 episodes an entire season. I think that's okay, right? That's pretty good, yeah. It's a good start to the first year, so good start. getting ready for a season two of the Papa Ron podcast. Crazy. And Jillian and I got some big, big, big plans, don't we? We do. Yeah. <laughs> is your mom coming on? I haven't asked her yet. I haven't asked mine either. I know. I want to do it, but just... Uh, I'm going to see her tomorrow. I'm going to see my mom tomorrow. Okay. So ask her. So uh, excited about what the future holds and, and really super excited that after a year <laughs> that we're still doing this, I'm super excited that Jillian has uh, joined me to be a part of this. And if I'm just raw and authentic for a moment, super excited about where I'm at in my life uh, on a mental level from where I was a year ago when I started this. Yeah. And, and, and of course the objective was for me to get myself in a better place and challenge myself to be open with the opportunity to share my testimony and my gosh, the response that we've gotten from so many people. Um, and I don't want to exaggerate it to make it sound like there's thousands of people, but it's a, it's a pretty good little clip of people that have reached out to say that they uh, enjoy the podcast and, in some way, shape, or form, an episode or multiple episodes has resonated with them. So thank you, first and foremost, to everybody who takes the time to either watch on Spotify or YouTube or listen on any of the other popular podcast platforms. Papa Ron Podcast brought to you by Brown Piercy Cattle Company. They've been breeding registered Angus cattle for generations with one thought in mind, quality beef for co consumers. Their goal is to deliver prime-graded beef directly to customers' homes more affordably than you can purchase them at the store. It's better beef conveniently delivered at a lower price in the grocery store. Find them online at brownpiercycattle.com, which reminds me, I need more hamburger from Brown Piercy Cattle. I have run out. And, um, We're about out too. And, and the, the, the warmer temperatures are upon us, which means grilling hamburgers yeah. outside. And yeah. so really excited about today's guest. Uh, this guy is uh, somewhat of a relative of mine <laughs> through marriage. Yes, he's a very popular guy. Let me hmm. let me give you a little uh, back history on today's guest on episode 37 of the Papa Ron Podcast. <laughs> you have bullet points? I do. Wow. This man has wrote 11 books. Has, okay. Yeah, 11 books. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, a few of those. He's been with the Independence Examiner for 40 years, been a host of the Sonic Locker Room radio show for 18 area high schools over the last 15 years. He was the very first print member honored by the Simone uh, Award Committee, uh, the first media member inducted into the Greater Kansas City Football Coaches Association Hall of Fame. Wow. He's covered every Kansas City Royals post game, including the last four, the, the uh, all four of the World Series that they've been in. Did I say that right? That's right. Okay. And then he and his wife, Stacy, um, uh, she's a wonderful woman, uh, are members of the Church of Resurrection. I am honored hmm. to welcome to the Papa Ron podcast, Uncle Bill Althaus. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uncle Bill. Uncle Bill. Well, uh, you know, only only took thirty seven episodes to get me. I've been sending him notes, emails, <laughs> oh. went, Come on, man! I mean, I I got a visit with Papa Ron. Bill, I was trying to get to the point where you were so desperate to get on this show <laughs> that you were willing to pay us to get on here, hey. but you oh. <laughs> right here, buddy. Hey, man, thank you so much for coming on, dude. Oh, no, thanks for the invitation. This I, is so you cool. Know, I, uh, what 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 you mean to our family? What you oh, mean wow. to this community? Uh, the impact you have made, your honesty, your integrity is uh, so special, and it's just such an honor to call you a friend. That's cool. Aww. That's so sweet. That's so nice. Well, we're into this thing uh, four minutes, and I'm already crying. <laughs> uh, no, but really, it's so cool to have you here. Naturally, there's a lot of things that we want to cover, and, and uh, your friend Bobby Kerr obviously had oh. you on his podcast. I got a chance to listen to that, so if you all, it's called the ABC Podcast. I'll give Bobby a little plug. <laughs> the Always Be Cool Podcast, right? I think is That's the right. So go check that out. 
Uh, Bill was on that yeah. great podcast. You had some amazing stories. So we'll probably revisit some of those stories. But one of the things that I wanted to do on this particular podcast was visit something that is incredibly personal to you. And only really, if you're a part of the family, would you know something about it? We're going to get in deeper to that later, but you have an incredible testimony. And I think it could resonate with people who might be listening, who um, have a loved one, or even themselves could be going through a difficult time. So we'll touch on that in a little bit. So you've always been into sports. I mean, based on your brother, Rick, and what he's told me, the minute you come out, you were, you were all about, you know, getting autographs and chasing down celebrities and yeah. following the game. And so a lot of fun. what was your, what's your first, uh, what, what's your first memory of being hooked on a particular player or a sport and, and just being obsessed with following it? Well, I, I, I was literally the kid who went to bed with the little transistor radio on his pillow <laughs> listening to the Kansas City A's. Okay. Uh, they were horrible. <laughs> Every time they got a good player, the New York Yankees, Snatched him away. Mm. Uh, so Mr. Those, those Roger th- Maris. <laughs> those uh, things Raleigh haven't changed. Sheldon, yeah, you know. Um, uh, I, at any time I could make it out to Municipal Stadium. There at 22nd in Brooklyn, I was there. Mm-hmm. And um, I had I did not have one athletic bone in my body. Oh, man. And when I went to high school, I discovered that they offered this course called journalism. Mm. And I'm like, well... You mean where you can write about sports and you you can go to the Friday night football games free? <laughs> yeah, right, I'm exactly. in. Where, where exactly. do I yes. sign up? And um, had uh, a teacher. You know, every everybody should have that one mentor, that one teacher that changed their life. Uh, mine was my high school journalism teacher, Ron Clements. Um, you you took introduction to journalism as a junior. Uh, my senior year, I was the uh, co-sports editor of the paper, and uh, that paper won the Robert Kennedy Journalism Award as the best high school newspaper in the country. Wow, wow. that's cool. Um, our editor and Mr. Clemens went to Washington, D.C., received the award from Methel Kennedy, and I was hooked. Mm. I just was was hooked. I uh, went to Northwest Missouri State University um, and was a uh, the sports editor my freshman year, which was a bit daunting, but <laughs> had a great time there. Also dabbled in broadcasting, broadcast basketball and football games. Cool. For the Bearcats? Uh, for the or, Bearcats. Nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Way, way, way before. <laughs> before they became <laughs> the level that they are now. now, man. I mean, this Wouldn't that have been cool if they oh were at that God. level? My gosh, yeah. they're, they're on top of it. And each sport. You know, the coolest thing about... The basketball program, a young man named Isaiah Jackson, who I covered four years at William Christman High School, uh, was part of, of two national championship teams his freshman and sophomore year. Uh, they didn't make it that far this year, but I still see Isaiah working at the gate, working in the press box at William Christman events, <laughs> and the family that they have at William Christman he said is replicated with the family they have mm-hmm. at Northwest Missouri State, and he's thrilled with uh, with making that decision. And uh, boy, the sky's the limit for him. That's yeah. super cool. But um, uh, I graduated the year of Woodward and Bernstein, so everybody in the world wanted to be a journalist because you could work with Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman, you okay. know. And um, spent two years at uh, KQTV in St. Joseph, Missouri. Okay. What re- uh, is uh, as a sports reporter as there? A, as a weekend anchor? sports anchor. Okay. okay. Uh, did politics three days during the week. And then uh, in 1981, an opening uh, came at the Kansas City, Kansan, which is no longer around. I was there two years and then have been at the Examiner the past 40. Wow. That's incredible. And I, I love what I do. I mean, I'm, I'm 69. Um, I I have no plans in retiring. Uh, a good friend of mine, the baseball coach at Blue Springs High School, Tim McGilligan, and I kind of have a pact. Uh, <laughs> his son is a freshman, okay, baseball player, so we may go out together when Connor graduates. Oh, so, so that means you know we'll we'll four, see what happens. You said he's a freshman, right? He's so, a freshman, so right, four so, more years. All right, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, you talked. To, I, I, I'm just asking out of curiosity because I didn't know that you ever covered politics. What was was that uh, out of your wheelhouse a little bit? It, or did, it was, it was, but and it, what did it, what did that involve? Because politics back then looked a whole lot different than it does today. Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, we had a pretty controversial mayor named Gordon Weiser, and um, I, I did a lot of things with him. Um, and I'm embarrassed. I can't think of the gentleman's name, but a, a guy that was 
skyrocketing in uh, the political process. Everybody said he'd be president one day, and he got killed in an uh, airplane crash with his family. Hmm. And um, From Missouri? From Missouri, okay. yeah. He was from a uh, uh, little town, uh, Chillicothe. Okay, yeah, there. I know where that's at. And yeah. um, hopefully I'll remember his I'm gonna name. I'm going to Google it. Okay, there you yeah, go. Please, please do. If I find it, uh, I'll let you know. Did you enjoy that part of it? Or yeah, was I did. It something that uh, you, you know, I, I, I enjoy competitive things, and boy, politics. That's, oh, for sure. Uh, that's very competitive. So when you were doing it, were you having to be kind of a neutral moderate, oh, moderate yes. to then bring someone on your side of the aisle that then would have kind of like a debate? Or well, what? and I hosted several debates okay uh hosted all the mayoral debates while i was there and um if you know you you see a different side of things you see the public persona and then you see uh the political persona mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes they don't mesh right so right. It, it, it was very interesting is it um is it jerry litton jerry litton there jerry litton he, see there's a reason why jillian's on this show she's yeah. fast Jillian. with the research uh, yeah. i became very good friends with his mother and father okay. and the community was devastated they were devastated um it, i was 22 23 at the time maybe and I had never been around anything that was that impactful. Mm. And he he literally... Like the, the death that was impactful? The death was impactful. <clears throat> the impact that he had made in uh, northwest Missouri was impactful. So he was a... Okay, so he was a, a state representative. State representative. And he had just won the primary yes. to be senator. Yes. For the Democratic Party. Yes. Um, so he died, it says he died in a plane crash while heading to his victory party. Yeah, with his oh. family. So even more impactful that that it wasn't just a random oh, right. day. I mean, this was. It was he had just won the primary and was headed to his victory party. I mean, he was going to be a senator yeah. for how X number of years and then the next Democratic presidential run, he was going to be the the yeah, candidate presidential or, or candidate. Run, run. So, so now I'm trying to go back to my uh, American politics classes, but mm -hmm. in the case like that where he then passed after was elected, but hadn't been, I guess, sworn in or he was know. senator elect, is what <clears throat> right? It says. So who then does the guy who lost then take his spot, or how do they fill that seat? Well, Joseph Teasdale was was the senator, and I think he could, he was the Democratic senator, and I think he continued, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I was just curious. Many, many years ago. All right. Well, we got it. You got um, you got some amazing stories from the 40 years that you've got, right? 40 years total, I 40 guess? Year, well, mm -hmm. 40, 40 years at the examiner, 46 right. years total. Of covering sports. Um, I mean, I just remember sport or stories that you've told me, Rick has told me, stories I heard on Bobby's podcast there's some remarkable stories there um <clears throat> i was going to ask you what um you, what was the what was the first moment that you were like like when you you covered something and you kind of maybe got shell shocked or oh. celebrity struck you know like that first opportunity you're like wow am i really doing this what did that look like walking into the kansas city royals locker room okay mm -hmm. All my ball cards were right there in front of me. Wow. And when was it like how far into your career was that? The 1976 first year. Okay. So 1976, the Royals began a string of three consecutive division championships. They lost to the Yankees every year in the playoffs. Yep. 1980, they went to their first World Series. Mm -hmm. um, George Brett wasn't george brett mm -hmm. in 76 yeah. well, that just was just a breakout year and you know i'm this kid from saint joe we're exactly the same age he's seven months older than i am <laughs> i'm walking in that locker room and and he and john wathan who was the godfather of my oldest son zach oh wow became very good friends <clears throat> and uh you know you why well, george hey how the hell St. Joe, you know? <laughs> I mean, my God, they know where I'm from and they know my name. I right. am the coolest person sure, in the world. Right. Sure. And it, it, it was amazing. It was just such a yeah. fun time. Yeah. Um, that was when I worked at Channel 2, okay. uh, then went to the Kansan. And uh, when I worked at the Kansan, did some travels with the Royals and went to every away game with the Chiefs. Did that for six years. And, wow. Then we had Zach, and it just wasn't fun being away from my son. Yeah. Okay. He uh, he and Stacy would always come pick me up at the airport, and one time he came, and he played uh, 
little league uh, softball at this complex in Independence, and they had these red hats, and I could see something scribbled on it, and it was, miss you, uh, my friend Bill. I never <laughs> I never made another road trip after that. Really? That's yeah. where you just hung it up? Yeah. And <clears throat> is that, what year would that have been? Uh, that would have been 1988. <clears throat> Zach was three. Okay. Yeah. Is that why you kind of stopped doing cover, or I guess you still covered professional, you oh, just didn't tra- travel is what you're right, saying. Right, didn't gotcha. travel. Okay. Uh, still went to spring training with the Royals. Um, you know, I, I, I quit traveling with the Chiefs the next year. Um, early on, it just it just didn't hold my interest. Um, plus, I mean, people, folks, before Patrick Mahomes came, let me tell you about the <laughs> Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> Yeah, I I covered Frank Sire at Ooh. quarterback. Ooh. I you know Todd Blackledge. Well, Bill Kenny was in there. He wasn't a terrible quarterback. He was a he was if a he, decent quarterback on a terrible team. Ex- if he'd have had a line, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, he and Carlos Carson could have mm-hmm. been Steve Young and Jerry mm-hmm. Rice. Mm-hmm. Bill Kenny could deal, mm-hmm. but he's always yeah. on his back. Yeah, you know it, that those were some tough times, but um, <laughs> you know Marty Schottenheimer came in. Yeah. Um, Carl. Peterson, who uh, was a very divisive figure when it came to running the team, but was very successful, just mm-hmm. just never won that big game. Yeah, and then I, boy, if there was any coach I was ever around, I really considered Marty a good friend, and boy, he deserved a, some kind of a championship because yeah. he worked so hard. Yeah, he really did. and. Uh, you know, things kind of got away from him there at the end. You know, they had some real thugs in the locker room and, and different things like that. And, boy, it, it was a tough way for him to end. And and then he goes to San Diego and has that amazing season, loses in the first round of the playoffs. Yeah. You know, it just wasn't meant to be for Marty. Right. Can we go back to George Brett for a second? Yes. Okay. Because I've heard, um, and I'm, I would I would not I wouldn't even try to repeat some of the stories I've heard, but I have heard a handful of stories. People always like to share negative things, right? Yes. More than they would want to share positive things. So yes. I'm not asking you to share anything negative. Um, I would just like to believe, and I will continue to believe, I've never met George Brett, but I love him to death. My kids all started out their their ball playing as number five. Number five. Of, yeah. Um, so what overall, What I mean, I'm not saying people don't have bad days. No. Those bad no. days turn into negative stories that get passed on and passed on and passed on, and I get that. But overall, like... Oh, was he was he difficult? Was he did he have a dry sense of humor that it was misunderstood? Was he what 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 do you think? Or was Why? he one of those guys where he had to be in a circle so he might have been cool with you, but you could see him be a real DB to mm-hmm. you know That's other possible people? Too. Sure. So what's That's what's possible. your thoughts on that? No, you know, I'm glad you asked that because uh for twenty years George was one of my best friends. Wow. Um I went to his wedding, he came to my wedding. Uh, I can't tell you how many times he invited uh, my boys over to swim at his house. Mm. Um, a great story related to George Brett. <laughs> my youngest son, Sean, never spoke in class. He's in kindergarten, and I get a call from his teacher, and, and she goes, Bill, I have to ask you something. Um, were you and Sean at George Brett's house yesterday? And I said, <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, we were. Mm-hmm. And she goes, well, I asked the kids a question. What's the largest man-made object on the planet that you can see from outer space? And Sean was the first one to raise his hand. <laughs> oh, my. Well, the answer is the Great Wall of China. Mm. So Sean raises his hand and says, George Brett's house. <laughs> <laughs> he actually oh got lost God. in there. I hear this voice. <clears throat> Dad, and George and I had to go find where he was. Oh so my gosh. George, uh, so like I say, he wasn't George Brett when I first started covering. Sure. So we grew up together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We were friends long before he was the hottest thing in Kansas City until yeah. Patrick Mahomes came along. Yeah. Um, he could be surly. He didn't like signing autographs. He did not like to be interrupted at meals or during conversations. Okay. But um, I saw him do some amazing things, not only with my kids, but he had a heart of gold when it came to mm-hmm. kids. Mm-hmm. And okay. I never saw him turn down a kid's request for an autograph, unless there were 10,000 of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, I, you know, I, I saw some uncomfortable encounters with some adults and things like that. But George, um, you know, I, I haven't talked to George in a couple of years. Mm-hmm. We're just not in the same circle anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But... Um, 
he he's very special in my mm. life yeah. and he treated stacy with great respect mm-hmm. uh so did leslie his mm-hmm. wife um uh, leslie is at a ball game she has a large straw type purse that's kind of under her seat and open sean goes running down to see her and kicks a 44 ounce beer <laughs> in to her purse and i thought well that's the end of my relationship with george (laughs) so i go in the next day and george didn't say anything and i'm like hey i i I got the suspense is killing me did did leslie tell you about sean knocking that beer into her purse he goes no and i thought how cool yeah is that that she didn't i said you know that friend of yours his kid knocked the beer yeah right right right. i i loved her for that Mm. wow that is it's yeah, I knew that you had a pretty good relationship with them, but I appreciate you being, you know, honest with that because like Jill had alluded to earlier, you do hear two different sides. Oh, absolutely. And unfortunately, you know, you want to believe you don't want to believe the negative, but sure. then when you hear it a couple of times, why do you think he was surly about that? Do you think it was just because people were trying to profit off of his signature? Well, I don't know if it was so much that. It was just he was it in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was nobody else. The Chiefs were god awful yeah uh we had lynn dawson but you know the kids knew lynn dawson as a broadcaster for channel nine they didn't remember him winning (laughs) exactly super bowl four and he he just was hounded and i i had lunch with him several times i was out in public with him several times and man there's some rude people out Mm -hmm. there um if you treated him with respect he treated you with respect if you didn't treat him with respect it could get ugly fair enough yeah Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I remember you telling me a story about Albert Pujols. Um, you know who Albert Pujols mm-hmm. I is, do. right? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Sometimes Jillian, I got to like double back <laughs> just to make sure that she knows who we're talking about. You know that he played baseball at Fort Osage, right? He was a, he actually lived here in Kansas City. Okay. And so you didn't know that part. I don't know if I knew that. If I did, <clears throat> I forgot. It's all right. My brain, if I don't want to keep it up there, yeah. it just goes... Well, Bill talking about how George had a relationship with his kids and his wife reminded me of the story that Bill had told me, I think over a holiday one time, about uh, you guys having dinner with Albert Pujols. Well, if Fort Osage had just won their second state championship in baseball. Okay, mm-hmm. We were in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, I took Sean to the game because he loved Albert and Chris mm-hmm. Franca, who was Albert's best friend on the team. Now a very, very successful businessman in the Kansas City area. and uh, So this is still when Albert's in high school. In high school, okay. when he's a junior in high school. Uh, Sean comes over to me, and I'm doing an interview with the coach, and he goes, Dad, Albert and Chris want me to go on the bus with them to eat. And I'm like, okay. So I, I look over, and they both kind of had this cat that ate the canary grin, you know. And <laughs> I see – Chris get in his seat, Sean get in the seat, and Albert, and they're all there. And so they had um, a steakhouse in Columbia that where you cooked your own steak. Mm. Okay, uh, it's no longer there, but they had this massive grill in there. So when I get there, all all the Fort Osage kids, the administrators, the parents are all around this grill, and you know, cooking an occasional steak and cooking a chicken breast here. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, Albert sees me, he goes, hey, dad. <laughs> and, and, and they had a steak. It was, it was like called the Big Daddy or the Big Monster. Mm-hmm. 32 ounces. Well, guess who was cooking that? Sean. No, oh, boy. my gosh. And oh, my every gosh. time I see Albert, we talk about <laughs> that. And those, you know, and, and Sean went over ate with that took him probably three hours to cook that thing yeah uh i know they ate more of it than he did but wow um i knew albert was going to be special when i saw him in high school yeah Mm. um but i never dreamed he would be the premier player star you know had had it not been for barry bonds and and steroids Mm -hmm. albert could have won nine mvp awards no doubt um you know he finishes one of three players to hit 700 home runs uh so is he retired yes he he just retired retired last year year, yes st louis right well, he uh, started there. Started in St. Oh, Louis, went to the, the uh, Angels, and then oh. the uh, Cardinals brought him back for one year so he could retire oh, okay. as a Cardinal. that's what I thought. Mm-hmm. And he okay. and uh, uh, Molina and Wainwright, uh, the catcher and pitcher, the stars of the team, all retired at the same time. Yeah. 
And I wasn't there, but I guess there wasn't a dry eye. Oh, I bet there was when that I'm happened. sure, yeah. That's big. But, uh, you know, my wife and I are in a Bible study group, and we were having dinner with the people in our group on a Sunday night, and my phone is just exploding. And I'm like, this is either good or really, mm, really bad. Yeah. yeah. So I look at it, and a friend of mine says, turn on 60 Minutes. Well, 60 Minutes did a piece on Albert Pujols. So the camera is shooting over he and his ex-wife Dee Dee's shoulders and they're looking at a scrapbook so i rewound and went to it every story was by me oh my gosh really and i thought <laughs> that's pretty that's pretty cool, cool. That i mean really i'll cool. never cool. be on 60 minutes but my name is <laughs> right there with was. albert Pujols. Your so work was. That, 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 that was a nice little deal that's I was a little surprised to hear about him and her getting a divorce. I remember seeing a special on them when they were together or were dating. She had actually had a Down syndrome child mm-hmm. from another relationship. And one of the things that she loved about him was how Albert, you know, treated that child and gave it so much love and affection and how difficult she thought it would be to find somebody that would accept her and their child being that the child Mm. had Down syndrome. And here's Albert, who's a major league baseball player um, and, 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 you know, ended up loving that kid as if it was its own. I was a little surprised to hear about that. Do you still keep in contact with Albert? Uh, no, not, not so yeah. much. Um, I was surprised. One of my good friends, Phil Calderella, who is a legendary uh, trainer and, and baseball follower from Fort Osage, uh, is very involved in Albert's uh, charity for Down Syndrome kids. Mm-hmm. Raises hundreds of thousands of dollars for Down mm-hmm. Syndrome. And, um, you know, I, I've never asked Phil about it. And I all I know is what I've read. I was surprised. Mm-hmm. But uh, I know that uh, that that his compassion for anyone with Down syndrome, especially children, mm-hmm. uh, still burns bright for sure. Yeah. And I think I saw tweets out there that it gets very amicable. There was nothing. Oh, it was. Like, and yes. I'm not trying to get anything juicy sure. here. I sure. was just when you bringing up his name reminded me of of his, as you put it, passion for Down syndrome and how cool I thought it was when I saw that story of him marrying someone who had a child with Down syndrome, being at the status that, that he was. Let me ask you, when you were, you know, Jill and I worked in radio and she was very, very blessed to where her first entry to radio was at Q104. Like, you know, we, we, typically you kind of got to work yourself up the ranks and you kind of alluded to starting in St. Joe, but mm-hmm. you didn't really spend a lot of time before what I would call coming to the major leagues, you know, no. to Kansas City. Did was there a was there a stepping stone process upon getting to Kansas City to where you were working your way up? I mean, I think you pretty much alluded to once you got to the examiner, you were already traveling with the Royals mm-hmm. and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. how does that opportunity, or is it just different in in newspaper or or print than it is in in radio? Well, um, you know, I, I I had the degree. You have to get that piece of paper back then. You back did. then you did. Okay. Um, you know, worked in TV and and would come down on weekends mm-hmm. and um, do something, uh, especially if it was in the afternoon or every Sunday game, since I had to anchor the news uh, those nights. Um, it, it, it was a process, and it was certainly a growing up process for me because I had to learn how to go from being the craziest fan you'll ever see from my hometown Mm, teams to somebody who's following them and has to be very impartial. And that was a little bit tough, but I certainly got the hang of it. Mm -hmm. And my gosh, we had an NBA team. We had an NHL team who are now gone. I guess Uh, I didn't know that. Who was the NHL team? uh, The NHL team uh, went to Colorado and became the Avalanche. Avalanche, Really? Yeah. Yeah. I guess they were only here a couple of years, played at Kemper. Okay. Um, it was uh, it was um, the, the NCA head was here. I mean, everything that involved with the NCA, they would have their their Big Eight coaching uh, tournaments uh, or uh, news conferences, and yep. you know, mm-hmm. Osborne and and uh, Switzer, uh, Nebraska's coach. Os- oh, Tom Osborne. That's Osborne and then Barry, Barry Switzer. Barry, uh, Switzer, Switzer from uh, yep. Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. You know the, these guys would come. All, all, all the big time college coaches. Were, I mean, my gosh, it was it was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. It was a great, great time to be involved. And uh, 
it, you know, I was in heaven. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm mm. single. I'm going around doing things that I used to pay for. Yeah. Uh, got to know somebody. That's the biggest guy. perk, right? Yeah, well, that, that's why I did it in high school. You yeah. Know? Right. It was yeah. crazy. But. But it, it was just so much fun, and 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 it's and it's still fun. I mean, it's not fun being at a crappy high school soccer game when it's raining. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But other than a you know some moments like that, um, I, you know I've never worked a day in my life when it comes to my mm-hmm. job. There are things outside of my job I'm I'm not real happy about sometimes, but the, the actual job, meeting the kids, you know, people ask me, uh, you know, how, how do you have so many friends who are like 30 40 years younger than you are brian mccray's one of my best friends i covered him when he played football at blue springs high school mm. wow skylar thompson mm-hmm. i to the the principal at at fort osage high school took a picture of me interviewing skylar after they won the first state championship in football at fort osage and um uh, yeah, I still have that that photo. And Skylar was in town, and we got together a couple of weeks ago, and yeah. I showed him that photo. And he said, you know, Coach Shards always called me a skinny little geek. And looking at that picture, <laughs> I was a skinny little geek. So It really was yeah. until he got to K-State, K-State. and they fattened him up a little bit. Oh, or or beefed him up, I should yes. say, fattened him up. Yeah. Um, no, you definitely have a ton of relationships with, with a lot of different people. I would be curious to know – how hard it is to do your job being that the landscape of media has changed so much from a linear to digital. Yes. Um, And there's, I mean, you just see like newspapers that are going out of business, magazines Mm -hmm. that are going out of business. And this is something you've done for 40 years. This is your craft. This is what you do. Like, and you're at towards the tail end of your career. You've talked about potentially retiring in four years. So if for whatever reason you were let go tomorrow, wouldn't be the end of the world. But if somebody who had that passion say was in there coming out of college or Mm -hmm. whatever, um, what, what, just to kind of talk about how the landscape has changed and what has challenged you as somebody who's been kind of a traditional journalist. Right. Um, you know, uh, the examiner comes out five days a week. Uh, there is talk that, uh, in the not too distant future, we may either go all digital or we might go two papers a week, Mm -hmm. but we would still have the content online that we would have in the papers. Yeah. But Ronnie, I mean, you know, I'm 69. I like to pick up a newspaper, yeah. but <laughs> I was just talking to a coach about this last night. I check the obituaries every day, and I go, well, there goes a subscription. There yeah. goes a subscription. <laughs> right, you know? right. True, the people yeah. that subscribe to a paper are uh, a dying breed, a bunch yeah. of dinosaurs. What is that target audience, would you say? Well, I would say... As far as the, the we age did, group. We did a poll in the paper, and the top two things by a landslide were our high school sports coverage. Yep. Yeah. And obituaries. Yep. And I think it's 40 plus, 50 plus that that still get the paper. Or it's the parents who have the star athletes. So they can have the clippings for the scrapbook. And we can look on an analytics site with our paper. And most of our stories, my stories, the sports stories, Mm -hmm. are read early in the morning, late in the afternoon. Well, they get it and read it before they go to work. Mm -hmm. They read it when they come home from work. (laughs) So, um, And is there a subscription for online as well? Yes, there is. I mean, is it it equal? Is it the same? Oh, it's it's like four bucks a month. Yeah, it's cheap. So, you know, we're hoping that that folks will, uh, you know, be involved with that. I've had so many coaches, activities directors, and leaders in the community reach out to me, you know, asking what they can do to, to get the word out and let people know about the examiner. And there's there's no set plan. And as soon as there is, if there are major changes, I'll certainly let them know. But we have made such a great impact in the community. And um, I, it's going to be so sad for me if the examiner would ever go away and the young lady I was talking about earlier, Grace Slaughter, who's the the standout player from Grain Valley, who's going to Missouri. 
uh, her mom heard about this before the start of the basketball season, and she called me and she goes, "Please tell me you're going to have a paper through Grace's basketball oh, season." Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because a very, very good friend of mine is Aaron Iim, who was the former basketball coach at Raytown South High School, which is the most iconic high school in Missouri. Uh, had a coach named Bud Lathrop who won over 600 games, mm-hmm. um, and he called me and he he goes, "Bill," he said, "I." I just wish I could let people in Eastern Jackson County know how important the examiner is. They had been to state three straight years and had won a state championship. And he didn't have one article about it. Didn't Mm. have anything kids could put in a scrapbook, no pictures, nothing. Mm. And they, they aren't in our coverage area. Um, Mm. I am the examiner sports staff. When I joined the paper 40 years ago, we had 30 some people on our staff and we had four sports writers and four photographers. Wow. So it, it has been reduced completely. Okay. So let me ask then, did those people move on to something else or did it finally become a time when subscriptions began to decline that they needed to trim, trim fat and because you had the tenure that they retained you, what, what, well, what did that um, look like? You know, a lot of them went on to, you know, a, a couple of them went on to the star. Um, uh, most of them got out of, of journalism. Okay. Um, but nobody was really then fired because of no, like, say, budget no, no, cuts no, or anything like that. No, one person was fired. Okay. Uh, but, but, you know, they were let go of their job. And it, it was a lot of nervous nights. Yeah. You know, I mean, just, just did you have any of young. those or did you feel like you, or so you, you had nervous nights. I did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just wondering what was going on, but you know, we're surviving. Uh, we're, we're still the top newspaper in our category in yeah. the state. And, uh, you know, I'm proud of what we do. Small staff, but a very determined staff. Sure. Mm. Very talented staff. What are some of the things, so like if anybody would be listening to this and they're in that 40 to 50 or 60 range, you know, and they're that traditional newspaper subscriber who likes walking out on their driveway or onto the front porch and picking it up and coming in, sitting down at the breakfast table mm-hmm. to read the news as they're getting ready to go, you know, eat breakfast before work. Um you know, at some point there's going to be a shift. I mean, we've, we're right. seeing it, right? There is this shift to the digital space. Mm-hmm. What are some of the things that the examiner is doing to combat, you know, that transit, not really combat the transition, but maybe enhance um, it. In, right. Exactly. So, because the problem is, is that if you don't adapt or you don't adjust, then oh, you will be absolutely. left in the dust. And so what you talked about the online subscriptions, is there any other things that they're doing? Because at, at some point in time, if they can't get the newspaper, then the people who are listening to this podcast, and believe it or not, there are people over 40 <laughs> and 50 <laughs> and 60 that listen to this podcast. Yeah. How would they be able to get content from the, uh, beyond just an online subscription? Well, um, you know, the examiner uh, has subscriptions. The, uh, they, you know, you can go examiner.net and get all the information for that. Mm-hmm. Um, our website's pretty good. Uh, we a, a technology company bought us about over a year ago, and boy, we went through a roller coaster of emotions with that move, that purchase, and and now things are really good. We have a solid website. Um, you can go on there and find the stories. Um, we had the most amazing freelance photographer, a guy named David Rainey, okay. who was a dad who photographed his daughter playing soccer at Blue Spring South High School. He is now the Kansas City Currents photographer, the Kansas City Mavericks, Kansas City Comets. He works for several of the high schools, yet he still finds time at night for us. And he will take what we call a gallery. He'll, He'll get 10, 12, 15 pictures from an event. And when you go online, you can see all those pictures. Mm-hmm. And then if you want one of your son or daughter, you can contact David. And uh, he'll, he'll work out a way to get you the photos. And he is constantly giving away photos to kids. I just, I love mm-hmm. his passion. He, he is, to me, is the photography equal of me. I mean, it, I, I, I love these kids. Mm-hmm. Um, I there there are teams over the years that I honestly feel like I have sons and daughters on the teams because I become so close to the kids. Yeah. And now that I'm really old, I feel that way about some of the coaches. Mm-hmm. You know that very, you probably got very to the point friend. now where you're covering some of those kids as kids. Oh. Have, how many generations have you gotten into Three. now? Three? Three? Holy cow, you are oh old. I'm at, I'm at William Christman High School. Okay. Gentleman comes up to me and he goes, Bill, you did a story on me. 
1982, which is my first year okay. at the Examiner. And uh, he said, you see that young man out there playing? It's my grandson. Oh, wow. Ooh, Isaac gosh. Woodward from Fort Osage High School. Wow. And How did uh, that make you feel? I mean, that's kind know, of bittersweet. It made me feel old. Yeah. And, but, but it was cool. I mean, for him, you know, I... I, I because he didn't have to come up to you, no, right? And no. so he recognized you. He obviously held you Elderly in high regard. Guy walked up the stairs to me. Yeah, and um, it, you know, it made me feel old, but I mean, it made me feel great. Sure, bittersweet. And, uh, our player of the year in basketball four or five years ago, Claire Rose, uh, played her last game. She was an amazing little point guard at Grain Valley. Um, her dad came up to me at the last game. I'd never met him. He'd never sent me a text or an email. And uh, he had the story that I had done on him when he was the Truman High School quarterback from 1982. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And yeah. and Claire said, yeah, you know, I never thought to tell you. She said, uh, that story's up in our house. Been up there 40 years. Oh, so, my god. Well, back then, 36 years. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you know, it, it, when you walk into an activities director's office, when you maybe go and interview a student athlete at their home, mm -hmm. and you see some of the pictures framed, like I see one right over there. I walked in, I saw that, Ronnie, it just made me feel great. Well, you know what? I, I mean, I was, that that's a gift from your mom. Oh, I know. I've got one that she did on a <laughs> story they did on me when I was inducted in the Greater Kansas City Football Coach. And I thought it was framed so, just like It that. was so cool that, you know, and of course that, we're talking about Grandma Bubbles. You mm -hmm. might yeah. remember. She yes. passed uh -huh. away yes. um, a few months ago. And so she um, obviously very, very proud of Bill and his work and the stories that he was able to tell. And if you were ever to go into her apartment or even prior to that in her home, the entire like you, you, you go into the typical grandma's house. Right. And you think antiques and really mm -hmm. nice paintings on the wall. This woman has got walls littered with sports memorabilia. <laughs> Hockey sticks. Hockey sticks. Oh. oh, she loved the Mavericks. Oh, oh yeah. The, I've seen those Loved pictures, the Mavericks. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of weeks before she died, uh, the Mavericks always gave her tickets for every Saturday night game. And they had a big get-together for the team. And the coach called me, and he goes, is, is, you know, I haven't met your mom. Is she coming? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. So, uh he brought every player on the team over, personally introduced them. Mm -hmm. One guy who was good friends with me brought his helmet, had it signed by the whole team. Um, and she she, ate she it up. lived for the Mavericks. She did. I mean, and, you know, it would be like after a game, I might bring a player out, and I said, you know, mm -hmm. Andrew Courtney, Sebastian Chanel, this is my mom. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, came now, mom, you know, they got to get, not mom. I never called her mom. Grandma bubbles. bubbles. Right. Bubbles. They, they've got to get back. No, they don't. She's holding <laughs> onto their arm and oh they're looking goodness. at me like, what am I supposed to do? You got to know bubbles. That yeah. She is a talker. Yeah. She oh, loved to yes. talk and she loved to tell stories. And yeah. we definitely had some great conversations about sports and politics and life. And, and she was, uh, you know, one of the things that we didn't get to do that she really wanted, she did actually once i think it was for um i think it was a chief's playoff game um she had heard about the basement the fan cave that i had built mm -hmm. and then she wanted to come over and watch a game and so rick had went and got her and we were able to because she wasn't good with stairs sure and so we we brought her around the side in the wheelchair and she got to sit in the fan cave and watch the chief's game in the fan cave but one of the things that i i regret to this day that we weren't able to do is that she wanted to coo to uh come to the premiere event or be able to sit down with me and watch one of our Heartland Waterfowl episodes. Oh, yeah. Yes. And it just, it didn't work out. But I was very honored that Bill got to uh, come to the premiere a couple of years ago and, oh, and cover the premiere. And and then Bubbles was excited about the article that Bill had wrote about the show. Nice. Um, and so she especially had that article matted and framed. And, and so it hangs proudly um, in my office. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> Mm, that's just kind of a choky moment there. Um, <laughs> and, and so much so that I'm, I've completely lost my train of thought of where I was. Oh, I know what I was going to ask. So how how um, difficult is it when you've got all of these areas? Because how many different high schools are you covering? Like, Well, eight? in the Sonic locker room, we have 18. Right. And what we do, Monday morning, Tuesday morning from 7 to noon, we call each school. We have about 25 minutes. For each, the, the programs are 15 minutes. And we do nine shows Monday, nine schools Tuesday. With the examiner, uh, we cover Blue Springs, Blue Springs South, Truman, Chrisman, and Van Horn, Fort Osage, and Green Valley. 
How do you and cover all of every I, Friday yeah. night football game? Well, we we have some stringers that that um, have helped, but what is that? If you don't mind me asking, oh, a stringer, uh, yeah. like a high school student, uh, a okay. mailman, a businessman, like an intern, that, somebody yeah, kind of like yeah, was interested yeah, in maybe yeah, getting in there, and yeah, so you, you just know, kinda... I mean, and, and they don't want to be right. They they just go and get the information and write up a little something on okay. it. Okay, uh, the coaches call our sports editor, give him information. Uh, but this is something that Ronnie has really, really changed. We used to have somebody at every high school game. Yeah, that's the way it used to we be. We covered Lee Summit. Oh, wow. We covered Raytown. I lived at Raytown South High School during the basketball season because everything Bud Lathrop did was just so special. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, his 1990 undefeated state championship team, greatest high school basketball team I've ever covered. Um. Did that include, um, oh, my gosh, why am I forgetting his name? Javon Crudup? No, sorry. I think maybe I'm thinking he only played at Raytown then. Kid have played in Nebraska. Oh, Teron Lou. Thank you. Yeah, was he on greatest, that? Greatest high school player I've ever seen. Now, they, but that, that wasn't was the way, same team? way, way before Tyron. Oh, it was? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, uh, I, that team had uh, Javon Crudup, who went on and, and led Missouri to two big eight championships. Okay. And then... Um, uh, had a kid named Chris Lindley, who they found out lived a double life. Oh. This kid wow. was a straight-A student, just the pillar of the community. And on Saturday nights, he and a group of guys would go down and jump on trains down by Kemper Arena. Oh, I did think I heard about this. He fell under a train, cut off his leg, and drug him over 100 yards. Oh. No skin on his body from his neck down, lost his leg. And uh, KU had offered him a scholarship, and and they gave him the scholarship. He went for a year, didn't play basketball. But Lindley was the guy on that team. Oh, my gosh. What year was that? Pardon me? What year was that? 1990. 90. So Brown was Brown's? No, no, no. no. Yeah, no. That would have been Roy Williams' first year. Yeah, it was Roy Williams. Or second year, because I think he could. Another little fun story. Williams is down recruiting Lindley. And Bud comes up to him afterwards, talking. He says, "Bill, Bill, come come over here." He says, "Coach Williams has a question for you." He says, uh, "Hey," he said, "I've heard about this Stevenson's restaurant, and I want to take my family there to eat." I said, "Coach, I live a half a mile behind Stevenson's, so yeah. let him there." Pulled up in the driveway or in the parking lot there yeah. on Forty Highway, and he rolled down the window and said, "Thanks a lot. If you ever need anything from KU, let me know." <laughs> Last well, time right. I ever talked to him. Oh. But uh, that's really neat. If, uh, mm-hmm. if uh, Javon just had that team crawl on his back, he's about six, seven, six, eight, monstrous. Only high school kid who ever intimidated me. Mm. I mean, this kid was big. Wow. wow. And uh, led him to an undefeated season. Pretty amazing. Did uh, you still cover any of the professional teams, or your passion is really into the high school game? It's in and, the high. Now, and, I cover the Mavericks. Mavericks I'm there right. every night. Yeah. Uh, cover the Comets. You know, I'll go to half dozen Royals games a year and, and you know, pick and choose some Chiefs games. But um, it seems like the per- business model maybe has changed for the it examiner has because we, we give the we give some we give our readers something they can't the star I don't think really doesn't have any high school coverage anymore. So if they want to find out about the local kids, they can pick up the examiner. And you know, the comets uh, are just so much fun to watch with that indoor soccer. It's the only thing my wife will go to. She loves the really? comments. Uh, she so got is a couple she excited of things. about the Casey Curran then? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're going to go. You know, and we have a local girl from Green Valley who just got drafted by them, Ryland Childers. Oh, wow. She had an amazing career at uh, UMKC and then spent her last two years at KU. Oh, nice. So she's on there, so that's going to be fun. That's awesome. And uh, this new arena they're building down by the river. <clears throat> I've driven by it a couple of times. It's phenomenal. Is, is Matt working on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, her husband's actually My husband's part of that. One of the superintendents on the job for J.E. Dunn. Oh, you're kidding. Isn't that oh, cool? That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Pretty cool. Um, I had heard today, actually, uh, that they're going to get ready to do some massive renovations at the uh, Independence Event Center or the Cable Dahmer Event mm-hmm. Center because they're in. And I, I don't know if my source is correct on this. I was a little um, confused when he said it, but. Apparently, they're wanting to make some sort of changes. I mean, they're changing out the seats, the digital billboards, and then the new sound system, and then something about the glass hmm. because 
there's the possibility of putting an NF or NHL team or game in that arena. Have you heard anything? I, I this is the first I heard of any of now this. I, they, I'm surprised if there's anything with the the ribbon board or the um, the, the huge scoreboards, digital, digital scoreboards they have because they just replaced all of those last mm-hmm. year. But they had a huge controversy last year because they bring the st louis blues in yeah and mm. the glass didn't meet the standards of well, the maybe NHL. that's what it is okay so i wouldn't be surprised and plus every season if you're sitting down there i mean those pucks and guys helmets and sticks hitting it yeah it's you know you got like okay let me see if i can watch this game without it's hard some to wa- big gash across yeah it. it's hard to watch through the glass it for is sure. it really is so that wouldn't surprise me i tell you what jillian you walk into that arena and if Anybody would tell you it's 15 years old, you wouldn't believe it. Oh, I know. They have the upcake. They're always replacing seats. Um, Wonderful, wonderful people working there. Mm -hmm. You know, I live there. I should have a cot there. (laughs) Yeah, right. Um, (laughs) You know, especially with the Mavericks and the Comets going Uh on. And they're just so accommodating. Yeah, they're great. They greet you by name, and it's a wonderful environment. And, boy, um, independence. I never dreamed independence would have something like that. It's great. Mm-hmm. I'm curious as you know, we had Nate Bucati on the podcast last week. Mm-hmm. And so we spent some time talking about soccer. And one of the things that we talked about was, you know, for someone like myself growing up in a small town in Northeast Kansas, soccer wasn't a sport that we'd played. It wasn't mm-hmm. a sport that was really offered maybe at a very minimal level, but like in high school, we didn't have a soccer team. Sure. We certainly didn't have a hockey team. Yep. You know, it was the three major sports, football, basketball, baseball. Yep. Uh, maybe you did track or played golf, but other than that, I mean, those were the three big sports. So yeah. um, I know that you grew up in a small town as well in Missouri and, and maybe because it was closer to the city, soccer was more prevalent then. I don't know, but what was what was your knowledge of the games, be it soccer or hockey, before they arrived to Kansas City? Because now you got exactly you didn't know anything. Zero. So how did you educate yourself to where you could be informative and write about it? I mean, what was the how was how did that challenge look? I tell you what, uh, nobody's ever asked me that question, and I'm so glad you did because <laughs> Scott Hillman, the coach of the Mavericks, their first year, yeah, they were in the Central Hockey League, which was basically a step above a beer league, where guys just. They they'd go from playing a hockey game to driving a UPS truck. Yeah. I mean, it, it was guys that just wanted to, wanted play, to play hockey. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I knew nothing about hockey. My first game, uh, game story. I had uh, the third quarter in there. Well, they don't play quarters; they only play three periods. periods. So okay. periods and quarters. That was my first thing I needed to learn. Mm-hmm. And he walked me through everything. He had me come to practice. He had me ask questions of himself and of the players. Just phenomenal. He he took my hand and walked me through that first season. Wow. And the first national award I ever won at the examiner was called Hockey 101. And we took a picture of a player in his gear and then a picture of him without the gear on and then pointed the arrows to what they wore and how much. They were 25 pounds of, of gear, I believe, you know, in a game. Mm, wow. Um, it, it, I, I, I loved him for that. Mm. Well, then when the Comets came, uh, it, 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 it was the same thing with them. Uh, their PR director, who is now the uh, PR director and works uh, for the league with, uh, with the current, oh, uh-huh. Jeff Husted. Um Anything you want to know, I'll, I'll bring the players and their goalie, a kid named Danny Waltman who is one of my dearest friends. He's been in Seattle the past six years, but they play here every year, and we always get together, and he answered every question mm-hmm. I had. And uh, they had some wild rules when they started. I mean, they had a two-point circle. They had a three-point circle. Well, now it's more like the outdoor game, but it's just very high scoring. And you got a sheet of ice, got a sheet of plywood, and then you basically have got just – the most minimal carpet over that 
and I, I don't know how the guys do it. They get popped and go on the ground, go into the boards, and, I mean, they're right yeah. back up because mm. they know if they're hurt, there's somebody right there ready to take their place. Is the so flopping as bad and is is the flopping as bad in that sport as bad as it is in the uh, is it as bad there as it is in the MLS? It's horrible. Is it really? They, they <laughs> now have though a rule where you can be um you can be put in the penalty box. For flopping? Uh, for flopping. <laughs> um, a kid that played for that Kansas City Mavericks, uh, Tyler Kurger, this kid was just tough as nails. And I said, you want to go see an indoor soccer game? And he goes, yeah, sure. He left after one quarter. They do play quarters because of the flopping. He said he just just couldn't handle it. Yeah. Mm. And it, it used to really be bad, and they've really tried to clean that up. They have a whole new uh, regime, a guy named Keith Tozier, who was huge in the initial stages of indoor soccer, is now the president of the league, and he hates that. It, it's embarrassing to him. So they're, they're trying to clean that up. And uh the Comets do a great thing. Win or lose after every game, they bring tables out and the kids can come out and get autographs and photos. Oh, that's fun. And that's these cool. kids love the, the, sure. the kids love it, but the players love it. Mm. You know, and, and oftentimes I've talked to them after a tough loss and they say, you know, the loss isn't quite that bad when a little kid came comes up and says, Man, I loved your goal or this is the first sure. game I've mm-hmm. ever been to. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so they do a great job with that. That's cool. Great. Yeah, I'd like to check that out sometime. We, you know, my uh, little boy Rhett, <clears throat> he's been walking around the house for the last. Well, it was after the game we did. Yeah, we went with you. Yeah, uh, to, the, to celebrate bubbles, and we were in the suite, and that was Rhett's first. You know, he's just turned two, mm-hmm. and um, that was his first hockey game. And so he literally every single day, no exaggeration, walks around, and at least a couple times will say. Ha ha game, ha ha game. He wants to go to the hockey game, so we ended up taking him to the hockey game a couple of weeks ago, and he loves every minute of it. Yeah. He loves Aww. the the well, I shouldn't say every minute of it. I'll tell you in a second here what he doesn't like, but <laughs> what he loves is the cool thing about the hockey game is there's the action is always yes. yeah, it's always even going. when the action stops, there's rock and music yep. playing in there's the background, going, you know. Yeah. And Rhett loves classic rock. Maybe because he rides around on the golf cart with his daddy listening to right. the classic rock. And he puts his one finger up in the air. <laughs> and he, he jam- So it doesn't matter if they're playing Pearl Jam or Motley uh, Crue or whatever it is in the event center. He's, uh, he's just Wait a minute, those are classic rock now? They are, actually. Shoot. Yes, yes. Um, and he better's old. Wow, you're old. I yeah. know, for sure. <laughs> he doesn't like it when the teams score. Because oh. that, well, I should rephrase that. He doesn't like it when our team scores. When the Mavericks score, because the oh. horn, the fog horn goes off, oh, and it yeah. is loud, and then all of a sudden he gets scared, and he's mm-hmm. crawled up, and he'll get over that. But he loves going to that hockey game, and it is a cool thing. You know what's also really cool, and I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. Having you know us being small town Midwest guys who didn't really grow up around the sport, mm-hmm. be it soccer or hockey, and in this case hockey. How many people in this community? who probably also didn't grow up around it, love going to those games. I mean, I can't compare it. I don't know. I've never, I've heard about Wichita and some of the other people Mm -hmm. in the league, or I don't know, are they even still in the same league? They are. Um, I mean, that some of these places get decent turnouts, but I would have to bet that Kansas City has one of the best turnouts, right? Oh, they do. And they... um they have a new regime in there now. Mike Shikani is the new president, and he is going after a younger crowd. And, mm. oh, my God, what he's doing is is amazing. Mm. Um, they had a Tuesday night playoff game uh, this past Tuesday. Uh, nearly 3,700 people there on a school night, mm-hmm. a game that wasn't on the schedule. You mm. know, in the playoffs, you have to go with arena availability. And, I mean, half that crowd was kids. And those kids – bring mom and dad they bring older brothers and sisters they want to keep following the team and um it's great and and the uh, comets are following uh the same path and what the comets do that is genius is invite all these youth leagues oh yeah yeah. give the kids tickets well you know kids need a ride to that game sure (laughs) and then they need popcorn and all well hot dogs yep (laughs) Uh, and whatever dipping else dots, they sell the you know, got to get things. the dipping dots. All the things. But it, it, it's so cool because, you know, the, the guys on the comments don't make a lot of money. Some, some, some of the, you know, more, better well-known players do, but all these guys coach teams. Mm-hmm. And Rian Marquez, uh, <clears throat> one of the top players on the team, the big Brazilian, uh, coaches several teams out in Lee Summit and Blue Springs. Hmm. 
They all live up north because they practice at the soccer dome up off Front Street. But they, so many of them have teams that they coach, and their players come up after the game, and it's just like a family reunion, you know, and it's so cool that they do that. Hmm. What you, you said that they don't make a lot of much. You're talking about the comments, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> what would you say is an average salary for a player, you know, or, or – I mean, just, just to get some perspective. I mean, dude, they can't be doing that full-time. There's probably... Oh, none of them do it full-time. Yeah. You know, they, uh, so they what have would a be couple a- that drive Mercedes. Well, one is a financial advisor for Northwest Mutual. Okay. Uh, Neto, Niccolo Neto, their goalie, who is one of the smartest guys I've ever met. Um, you know, I uh, 400 a week, maybe. They, they, they okay. pay for their lodging. Okay. But a lot of them, uh, you know, don't make... And they have to work to keep their work visas you know some of the kids from brazil or mm-hmm. oh, uh, right. mexico things like that well that was the other question is that in order for them they would have to have the flexibility with an employer that would allow them to be gone to play soccer mm-hmm. right. to have a second stream of income there's right. i don't there's hey uh, there'd be a tough employer to allow that right when danny Waltman was here he was the icon the face of the league the most popular player in the history of this franchise mm-hmm He'd be taking shots off the face in practice, working his butt off, go in, take a shower, put on his work belt with his hammer and all that, and he roughed in houses. Hmm. I couldn't believe it when I saw that the first time. Okay. So I know nothing about the sport as far as like what their season looks like. So a season is 22 what? games. Okay. Uh, or 24 games. You played 12 over, at home. Over, um, 12 weeks, 24 uh, weeks, is it one, yeah. week, one yeah, game a week? Yeah, from like uh, late November. Uh, okay. It just ended two weeks ago. Okay. okay, they didn't make a deep run in the playoffs, and but they um, practice every day. Every day, yeah. A lot of times they practice start at like eight. Wow, you know, and get off at ten. So then these guys get done then, with practice and they and go, go straight to work. Go to work. Uh, mm-hmm. One of them works at UMKC in, in the grounds. Okay. Department. Um, now on the hockey side, though, because that has that has scaled. Like the, like yeah. you mentioned in the beginning, it was just a step up. A, beyond a beer league um now it's the echl okay and they have got they have high high draft picks Hmm. that play that you know might make close to a million dollars and it's so so are they a minor league team for the nhl yeah they are okay Okay. that's what i thought it's just like baseball sure it's tiered you have the nhl Mm -hmm. then you have the ahl american hockey league okay that's where they want to get to um the uh, the Mavericks Association is with the uh, Seattle Kraken in the NHL, okay. and then uh, the Coachella Firebirds, which is a first year team, and they've been great uh, sending players down. Um, they called up the Mavericks best player, and this kid will be in the NHL next year. I'd bet my life, Jeremy McKenna. Okay, he was an All Star, <clears throat> and you know I. I I, I, when people ask me what it's like, it's like, well, Alex Gordon was a superstar at Omaha. Yeah. And sorry, Omaha fans, but he's going to help the Royals. Well, that's how it is now. Okay. So would you, would you say then, and sorry for my ignorance, but then the Kansas City Mavericks would be considered as it, it, it is a double A. Uh, double A. Yep. That's exactly what I was looking for. So yeah. Coachella's be- triple A and they're double A. Okay, so like back in the day when the, you talked about Alex Gordon, he's yeah. double A would have been in Wichita. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now they're in like Arkansas or something right. like that, right? Right. Interesting. Okay. Well, we I, look. I, we talked about in the beginning of this episode that at some point you've got a very strong testimony and uh, you know uh, something that I think could potentially be helpful and bring awareness to some others. Before we're, that's coming up in just a bit, then we're, we're going to take a little break here in just a second, but. There is a very interesting story, and I think Jillian might appreciate this story okay. about your internship in New York. <laughs> and and I have heard, you ever had a guest who slept in Madonna's bedroom? I guess you did. Okay. <laughs> oh my. Well, that does but, sound interesting. Well, <laughs> I think you slept in it before Madonna got a there. Long before Madonna. <laughs> oh, okay. Me, me, and uh, Geraldo Rivera's cat. Yes, right. So tell the story real quick before we take a break and we come back with some deeper stuff. Went to Northwest Missouri State University. Um, I loved watching Goodnight America with Geraldo Rivera. This was back at the time when he was he was an icon in journal. He'd won the Peabody Award for a series he did on this god awful facility uh, in New Jersey, where they they took people and they they were laying in in their feces. They 
it, it mm. was horrible. He broke in through a window, brought a camera crew in there, and he was the toast of New York. Uh, he came to Northwest Missouri State. Wow. Um, he was showing the Zapruder film, Abraham Zapruder, of uh, the John Kennedy assassination, mm. proving, I mean, you watch this, and there's just no way you could say that one guy did it. Um, I picked him up at the airport. I was on the student council staff there. <laughs> um Drove him up. We hit it off. He spent all day at my farm up in Northwest. And he goes, hey, he said, would you like to spend the summer as an intern at ABC? Whoa. First time this Independence kid had ever been on a plane. Oh, my oh, God. Really? Um, yeah. Fly to New York. Uh, <clears throat> he said, I can't pay you. But he said, I promise you, you'll have a good time. And right. I'll find you a place to live. Uh, I lived with him. He lived four blocks east or south of the Dakota. Spent okay. a lot of time at the Dakota. Never saw John Lennon. I was so bummed about that. Oh. But uh, <laughs> where he lived, at the, the apartments, you had the whole floor. Okay. Um, Paul Simon lived in there. Wow. Um, it, 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 it was just... Did you um, come across a lot of these celebrities that lived I, in that know, building? You met a few of them. And the, the coolest thing, though, I, he said, uh, you know, what would you like to get from this? And I said, I, I just want to see what real journalism broadcast journalism is like yeah and i'd like to meet your father-in-law his father-in-law at the time was kurt vonnegut the writer oh so uh the madonna story i i went back in 1984 and was covering the chiefs okay. uh playing the jets mm -hmm. and i went by the apartment hoping i'd seen and he jogs right by me like 30 seconds after I'm on the sidewalk, he couldn't believe he goes, he said, forget about the hotel. You're spending the night here. Oh, wow. So he, he was in an apartment and then he later sold it to Madonna. Okay. So that <laughs> oh, was the Madonna gosh. deal. So what year, okay. So what year now, were, were you? I was interning? there in 75. Okay. The and summer then you went 75. Back. I went back to cover the Chiefs playoffs in 84. 84. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But, um, he calls me one day at the office and he goes, Hey, are you doing anything tonight? And I said, no. And, he said, okay, um, you know, be home at 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, uh, doorbell rings. I said, go, go get the door, and it, it was Kurt Vonnegut. Oh, mm. wow. And, oh, man, it, that was. <laughs> that was a big deal for you. That was surreal. Yeah, yeah. That, that was pretty crazy. And you got to spend some time with him and all talk? Or, all evening. Yeah. No kidding. Uh, we had just gone to um, uh, Muhammad Ali's training camp in Philadelphia, and, mm. and Vonnegut was a huge boxing fan and huge uh, Ali fan. Talked about that a lot. And, you know, I had to ask him about uh, Slaughterhouse Five, Cat's Cradle, all the things that I'd read in high school. And that, that was a pretty cool night. Wow. After having that experience and then coming back and spending 40 years in Kansas City, yeah. did you ever have aspirations to go? Or, or, and why not? Just too big. I mean, where ABC was located, right? Just within the same block was a school for the blind. Mm. Those people walked faster than I did. I mean, <laughs> the, the pace was yeah. unbelievable. Um, I, I I felt comfortable there because he was so welcoming to me, and his mom and dad, Rosie and Al, they they adopted me. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were out on at their home in Long Island eating family meals on the weekends and. Um, you know, it, it, it was amazing, you know, hmm. and the, you know, I mean, I'm a sophomore in high school, yeah. I mean, I'm in college. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there were no job offers, but I, I couldn't live. I, I have so much respect. I have so much respect for the folks who just live there. Yeah. I mean, the lady yeah. who right outside of ABC is selling newspapers and she has her baby in a, in a crib right now. it's just a her. whole different way of life it is. a whole different Man. world yeah. yeah it is i i was sad when it was over because he got me tickets to every broadway play at oh, the time wow. i went to the world premiere of rollerball with james con okay which is one of my favorite movies um he had a show called good night america yeah see I, okay so you started talking i want to hear the story yeah. but i <laughs> My first knowledge of Geraldo Rivera is the like Al Capone. The Al Capone. No, the daytime talk show, oh. like like the like Oprah or Phil Donahue or whatever. The throwing oh, that's chairs. That's right. Yeah, and and it was kind of like it was before Jerry Springer, and it would it was kind of the wild. Like, there was times he got bloodied up. And oh, it, he got hit by yeah. and hit. 
he's on the cover of Newsweek or Time, and it's just this, you know, the pixelated <laughs> yeah. picture for all those blood streaming down yeah. his face. Yeah, so I didn't even realize that he was a big deal before that. Like, See, I, and that's what, you know, people say, Geraldo Rivera, what a joke. And, you know, his reputation has been so sullied, and I hate that, because he, he had a convertible Volkswagen. He'd be driving down the streets, and I mean, like, the cops on horseback would come up and give him a high five. He could hmm. park anywhere he wanted. He could do anything. He yeah, wanted. he was a cool dude. He he was awesome. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so then was the was the talk show that I remember, which would probably be in the eighties. Yeah, I would late assume. late eighties. Late eighties. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So was that like a? Obviously, he had a whole other era of a career mm-hmm. that had come to an end, like by choice. Well, like, the, the, I mean, isn't it fair to say that that Al Capone thing that hurt him. that that did, did not do him any favors? No. And you probably are not familiar with that. Well, no, but I've heard that reference. But I thought that was like after the talk show. No, no, it was right around ref- the same time. It, wasn't it, it? was, yeah. It yeah. gets referenced still, mm-hmm. and then now I don't even know if he does stuff now. But like, he's on Fox. Yeah. Okay, he is on. Fo- I knew it was like more politics yeah. driven. Yeah. So, hmm, okay. So, yeah, the, what was your assessment of that? Because he got made fun of big. Oh, so he got slaughtered over the alcohol. I remember watching it. I was a kid oh, watching I it. it. I was yeah, like, what's this kidding? hidden treasure that you're going to find? And all that we found was like just not, not bottles. The, yeah, no, just, a couple of bottles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, Look, we found a bottle. We're on the right track. And then there was no track. Like, he hyped came, up. He came to Kansas City after that and did a story on Bob Bertola, the serial killer oh, who had Bob, the, Bob the market. Or Bertola. Delhi, yeah. Down yeah, at yeah. Uh, City Market, or what's yeah. the place down there uh, with the famous hamburgers? He had a like a a, the, a, a little shop. I was flea thinking, market, Westport the, flea Westport market. Westport oh, flea market. Oh, uh-huh. oh, okay. And he had like skulls and crazy. He stuff He had stuff in buried there. in his backyard. Yeah. like it'd been years and years of really. Yeah. Crazy. So yeah, Geraldo came down and did a story on it, and mm-hmm. we got together for lunch. And I, you know, I had to ask him. I said, "What about Al Capone?" He says. The only thing that's going to be written on my headstone is Al Capone's yeah. vault was empty. Yeah. And he made a fortune, but man, he, I know if he could take it back, he would have never yeah. done that. What, but, I mean, did he have some sort of, or did he share with you any detail? I mean. Like, why was it even a thing? Why was right. he involved? What he had to have had or thought he gotten some good, credible information mm-hmm. or intel that would allow him to put himself. And then was that somebody trying to sabotage him with like terrible information do you know like, i don't know did he never share he no, never shared I, I, mean, any details I, I, about? I asked him i said what well, you know what about it and he goes he said we thought there's some good stuff in there you know he he thought oh, there man. might actually within the vault be a, a safe that had all sorts of crazy stuff in it and yeah they weapons had, and and you know who knows i mean they, it was his vault it was in his house it yeah. was that was the th- or not his house but his his business his right business area. yeah yeah and there was uh, a whole construction crew with jack hammers oh, in yeah. there and cut and for like, like Two I've hours. Heard of it. Slud I shammers I and yeah. breaking down concrete and walls and stuff. It was nothing. insane. Yeah, nothing, nothing ever came of that. Well, that was some great storytelling, buddy. I appreciate You know, one of the, uh, you talk about uh, when we had uh, Ryan Lefevre on, one of the things that he said, and this is kind of going back to George Brett, but Ryan Lefevre said that George Brett was uh, a great storyteller, one of the best storytellers. Oh, that amazing. I think I think that you might be up there on his level. <laughs> You've got so many great stories. So, But when we come back, we're going to uh, dive in a little bit deeper. I had asked Bill to come on the show to share a lot of these great sports stories in the 40 years that he's been covering in this town. But being that I am close to the family, I also knew something that might be difficult to talk about, but it could also be very powerful and maybe helping anybody else. And so we're going to dive deeper into that when we get back into episode 37 with Bill Altaus on the Papa Ron Podcast. The Papa Ron Podcast is brought to you by the award-winning Heartland Waterfowl, airing each week on Sportsman's Channel. Check out heartlandwaterfowl.com for airtimes and be sure to browse their online store. Also, subscribe to the Heartland Waterfowl YouTube channel and watch their new original series, including their podcast, Behind the Blind. Check it out and don't doubt the scout. Now, back to the Papa Ron Podcast. Here's Ronnie Phillips and Jillian Gray. Pop Around Podcast also brought to you by Clean AF. Clean Polish Protect, specifically formulated to protect beautify surfaces, including plastic, vinyl, rubber, and carbon fiber. Water-resistant formulation, safe to use on gloss or matte finishes. 
and make up the, and makes the cleanup process easier by forming a durable coating that repels mud, dirt, and debris. Apply lightly buff to a dry sheen. Perfect for all power enthusiasts. Check it out online at cleanabsolutelyflawless.com or at Dell's Power Sports in Grain Valley, Missouri. Back with Bill Althaus. Uncle Bill. Uncle Bill is here. By the way, your uh, picture that you gave me a, for Christmas a couple of years ago of uh, a signature of President, former President Donald Trump is a great conversation piece for every single person who walks in the door to be a guest on the Papa Ron podcast. So I really appreciate that. That was pretty neat. How, by the way, how is it that you have access to all of these people to get these autographs? Well, a, a good friend of mine is a real heavy hitter in the Republican Party. Okay. And, uh, you know, if you needed Joe Biden, there's no way I could help you there. <laughs> I, asked, I asked my friend if he could uh, get something signed by Trump for you, and uh, yeah. he did. Oh, that was really cool. Yeah, and, and, and fortunately, um, there hasn't been any kickback or any, nobody's barked or said anything, but a majority of the people, like we had uh, Mark Alford, who came in? Oh, sure. And so we got a picture taken underneath that picture. We got uh, Chris DeGaulle, who uh, you might know as a sure. conservative talk show host. So sure. he was on the show and, and uh, naturally saw that and, and loved it. I'm, I'm hoping we get maybe can get Tucker Carlson now that he's not doing anything. Maybe we can <laughs> yeah, get him as what's a guest, going on right? with that? So <laughs> was he fired or was he not fired? That is the question. Yeah. Do we you know? know I, well, you know, they've come out with all these these emails that they uncovered in in you know the defamation lawsuit with the. Uh, well, the voting machine folks and Dominion, and boy, he he said some pretty crazy stuff. And I, you know, I don't know, I don't know anything. I, I, I just know that he was. They parted ways. Some say he wasn't fired. Some say right. he was fired. And I have not seen anything that has specifically given a reason as to why they, they parted ways. No. And in case you're <clears> listening <throat> to this, like, you know, who knows when this is like literally two days after, right? Mm -hmm. We're right, recording. Right, right, exactly. At, the, at this point. Yes, it is well, April 26, but, 2023. But wouldn't you think, I mean, if that's the case, and I know this is a total like rabbit hole, but wouldn't you think mm. that any contributor like that, like a, like a, like a show host, especially involving politics, okay, but especially maybe on the conservative side, maybe not, maybe also on the Democrat side. Don't you think they could go back and find all kinds of things that people say and imply and, and um, what, what's the other word? Not just imply, but accuse that mm -hmm. would be accusatory sure. that could be used as defamation. And I know there are like, there are specific guidelines or things that this is defamation. This is not. But don't you think with something like that, like as long as that whole thing went on about voting machines, like how could he not have said things mm -hmm. that would be considered that? And well, you could I'm, probably take any topic sure. involving mm -hmm. politics of a story that went, I mean, that went on for weeks and weeks and weeks of talking about how there maybe was mm -hmm. a problem with voting machines, whether there was or not, it doesn't matter. It was being talked about. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I just, that's crazy. <laughs> that, like you'd think, oh my gosh. Well, he's a commentator, you know? Yeah. And, and Not and only a commentator, he was the most rated show on the entire network. I know it. Right, and but he's got to have things to say. Like sure, that's what exactly. he's doing. He's filling yep. hours a week talking about what people are talking about. Yeah. So now, Don Lemon did get fired. As, yeah, as we do know tweet. that one. Yeah. Yeah. So. Saw that. <laughs> and surprise, it took that long. Um, <laughs> so do you have any heavy hitters that can get Tucker Carlson's autograph? I, I, Jillian I don't know. sounds like yeah. she's real interested in getting Tucker's you autograph. Need to get no, George I want him Brennan here, here I want because him here. he's a, he's a big Trump man. Player. If I had somebody that I knew that could yeah. swing that bat to I would, uh, hook, I would hook die. that up, I would die. Yeah, that would that would be pretty cool. I would yeah. die. Good thing you know if you know anybody, Bill. Wink, <laughs> wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. I actually do have a good friend who is uh, working on Skylar, so hopefully maybe someday down the road. And then, of course, if that doesn't work out, I, I know a guy in Bill Althaus who might be able to help us out. But anyway, we're really grateful to have you here. This is the part in the show that might be a little uncomfortable. And just again, before we get started, let me say how much I appreciate uh, your vulnerability and um, your willingness to tell you, you know, the testimony of your family, because it wasn't just you and it wasn't just your son. It was an entire family ordeal that was difficult to go through. And let me also say, because it's probably, I, I, I would be remiss. I, or I would be willing to bet that your son, Sean will likely listen to this. So I want him to hear straight from my mouth, how much I appreciate his, um, his uh, approval for uh, you telling this, his story, basically. 
So um, Sean had a, I guess I'll just open it up with this. Sean had a, a struggle with substance abuse for, yes. for several years. And, um, and there, there was a couple times that were very scary um, where we didn't know if he was going to make it. And um, I guess what I would like for you to do to your level of comfort is just kind of share his story um, and, and what that was like as a parent, how you guys worked through that as a family. And the good news of all of this is that Sean is doing great today. He is recovered. He's crushing it out there in the workforce. And all of us are so proud of him. It's amazing. But, but I, I want to hmm. use this opportunity, use our platform, your platform as mm-hmm. being a, you know, a notable figure in the community um, to kind of pull back the curtain, let people kind of know you on a more personal level. And maybe somebody who's got a family member, a son, mm-hmm. a daughter, or somebody who's struggling with substance abuse, hear your story and maybe might be able to provide them some hope. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm more than willing to tell this story to anyone. Uh, I spoke to Sean on my way over here and he goes, dad, I'm proud of you for doing this. He says, hope you get through it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. um, thank you, Sean. Yes. Yes. Um, How old is Sean, by the way? Sean is 35. Okay. Uh, he is now a recovery coach for Epic Recovery. Wow. He is the guy that when somebody comes in who is overdosed, who is really struggling, he goes through a process with them on how they can get clean and sober. Hmm. Uh, he just got this job a couple of months ago. Okay. Before that, he was a peer counselor with uh, Sana Lake and... He was in charge of a house of guys. Three of the guys that were in there had been in recovery with him. Oh, wow. When he was trying to recover from his opioid addiction. And how, so how long has he been sober? He's been sober three years. Okay. Was an addict. Always will be an addict, but struggled with it 16 years. Oh, my. This is 16 years of head on car collisions, hit and runs, being arrested. Several times, and as Ronnie alluded to a little bit ago, and and my wife Stacy, she she just just simply can't talk about this anymore, and it's hard for me to. But he I mean he OD'd and died three times. He was not breathing. And so you're saying almost almost twenty years. Yes, because sixteen years of struggling, three years then, sober. Yes. So almost twenty. He's thirty five. So we're talking about fifteen years old. Yeah, smoking smoking marijuana in the basement. Okay. Um, then he had a friend who said, Hey, you got to try this. And it was, uh, mm. um, opioids. Mm. Um, his mom could get them. And I, you know, I knew nothing about it. Yeah. He, uh, mm. you know, you hear about working alcoholics. Well, Sean was a working drug addict. I mean, functioning you, alcoholic func- functioning. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> um, he's in the grain Valley sports hall of fame. Uh, was a point guard on the best basketball team they ever had. He was one of the most popular kids in school, kid that just lit up the room when he walked in. Yeah, very personable. Oh, Very, very personable. And eventually, um, you know, he's shooting up heroin between his toes in our basement. Wow. Um, The first time he OD'd, um, I was writing – a book on Dante Hall. Mm-hmm. I was up very late. I, I would usually work on the books between 11 and 3 a.m. Um, he came home staggering, went down to his bed downstairs. I went down, basically carried him upstairs because I knew he was something bad was going to happen. Uh, and he's how old at this point, would you say? Oh, he's a senior in high school. Okay. So I uh, get him upstairs. And we have a spare bedroom right next to my office, and I hear a sound like I've never heard before. It was like a, a wild animal. Mm. It was just this this rush of air that uh, I went in, and he wasn't breathing. Mm. And my wife, a nurse, went in and got her. And uh, she, you know, this is like 3 in the morning, and she's like, oh, my God, he's not breathing. we got to do something. I said, do you want me to call 911? She said, no, we don't have time for that. Uh, put him in the back seat of my car. She was doing CPR on him, mouth to mouth CPR while this foamy, horrible mm. stuff. And 
man, she's she's just giving that CPR. Mm. I mean, mm. she she's amazing. Um, took him to St. Mary's Hospital in Blue Springs as we pulled up. The lady at the desk looked out and saw Stacy giving him CPR through the window. And before I even got on the car or got to their door, uh, staff members were out with a gurney. Mm. Uh, they put him on the gurney, and uh, uh, the lead nurse says, get him in there, get him in there. He's not breathing. Mm. Uh, I never knew this. They have a little room at St. Mary's for folks that they know that they're individual that they brought in isn't going to make it we mm. were in that room for two and a half hours mm. had no idea what was going on and um, is that where your wife worked no she works at center point oh, okay st mary's was just closer much okay. much closer we live out mm. in green valley mm-hmm. so um eventually doctor comes in and he goes i goes are you the mother of sean and I, she said yes and he goes come here and he said i want to give you a hug you saved your son's life mm. oh. that was the first time um, he also OD'd in his driveway, uh, off Vesper in Blue Springs and a guy across the street saw it, gave him CPR until the police got there. Mm. And, um, um, th- th- there's this drug that I knew nothing about called Narcan mm-hmm. and it's, a an inhaler. Mm-hmm. You snap it, put it under their nose and I don't know what it does, but it snapped him out of it when they were there yeah this one was really bad uh took him to saint mary's again and he had round the clock nursing for seven days Mm -hmm. one-on-one nursing because he had taken so many drugs Mm. uh they pumped his stomach and the the doctor there said he had enough pills in his stomach to kill a rhinoceros and i would ask him about this and say well you know he goes dad he goes, I don't take drugs to get high. I take drugs to feel normal. That's the toughest thing I've ever heard him say. Hmm. Uh, bipolar, all these different medical conditions that he was dealing with, severe anxiety. Hmm. So um, the third time it happened was in our basement. Uh, he had a friend over. friend came running up. It was late at night, and he goes, something's wrong with Sean. Hmm. Um one of the staff of one of the hospitals gave me two Narcan capsules and said, I hope you never have to use these. But he's down, convulsing, foaming, and then just nothing. Uh, I gave him the Narcan. Uh, his friend called 911. Um, Stacy wasn't home at that time. She, mm. she, she did get there before he left. And th- this was the first time it happened at our house. So we have, you know, four police cars and an ambulance and a fire truck and, you know, everybody there. Um, The first time was at your house, but you took him to the hospital, right? right. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah, the first time was at the house. Second time was in his driveway. This was at the house. But this, the first time, you know, we put him in a car Car and and took him. This time we called 911. And so, you know, that's when you got to start talking to your neighbors about it. They want to know what's going on. Sure. Um, So, uh Two police officers came, and they were amazing because he had pills, cocaine all over his 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 dresser in there, uh, had a gun in there. Mm-hmm. And this mm-hmm. policeman came in. He goes, hey, Dad, I need to show you something. He goes, you've got enough on your mind tonight. All I ask is that you get him help. Well, each time he had OD'd, he went to Valley Hope, in uh, Boonville, Missouri, mm-hmm. um, and left there happy, ready to go. And then eventually he told us it, it was great because you could get all the names of people you could get dr- drugs from up there. Oh it did gosh. nothing to help him. But hmm. it it was the first aspect of this that, that helped me because every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday they had family counseling at 8 o'clock. So I'd make the drive from Grain Valley up there, and the first day of counseling, uh, this counselor was awesome. I I don't know her real name, but everybody called her Mean Jean. She she was the drill instructor. So (laughs) she she mean yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So she said, "Okay, I want anybody in here who thinks that they're the cause of your person's problem. Raise your hand. I'm the first person." Sure. 
Took him to see ACDC when he was 10 years old. Took him to every professional wrestling match. Took him to rock concerts. You honestly felt like you were the reason for why he really. Yeah, and it was killing me. It was, that was the absolute worst part of all this because my oldest son, Zach, yeah. you make a blueprint for a perfect kid. It's yeah. Zach, yeah. you know, uh, smart, don't you, athletic. Don't you think any yeah. parent would feel that way though? I mean, I, I don't, I don't know Yeah, because I haven't been in those shoes, but I would think at some point, you know, because it started when he was still a kid in your I home. I should have noticed it. I should have caught something. Gotcha. I could, you know, I was the fixer. I mean, if anything's yeah. going mm-hmm. on, yeah. man, I, can t- I know everybody. I can take care of it. Sure. Mm. And, I mean, it's an illness. You yeah. don't want to have cancer. You don't want to have diabetes. Right. You don't want to be a drug addict, but there's just something that clicks. Okay. And the only reason my wife is still here today the only reason I'm still here today is because of Al-Anon, a program that parents, um, brothers and sisters, anybody that has an addict in their family go to. Uh, we've been going six years, so we were there at the height of all this. Mm. Um, the phone calls at 3 in the morning to get him out of jail. Uh, the the babbling phone calls from him that we couldn't even understand. Um, I didn't know Arrowhead has a jail, but they do. I had to get Sean out of it twice. Really? Um, they call it a holding sure, area. Sure. Like a holding but, cell. Um, Stacy, um, Stacy is now the head of Alateen for the state of Missouri. Wow. For kids whose parents are alcoholics and she just took six kids to their big convention in Tantara and they just rocked it. These kids Mm. love her. The, and you know, she can't really talk about it because it's confidential. Yeah. Yeah. What you see here, what you say here, let it stay here when you leave Mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. But she is making an amazing impact on people. Um, we go to a meeting, uh, in blue Springs every Saturday morning at nine o'clock Ronnie, I'm I'm covering a game on a Friday night. I get yeah. home and write my story. I get to bed about one thirty. I wouldn't miss one of those meetings mm-hmm. if my life depended on it. Um, Sounds is, like your life does depend on it, or did it depend does on depend? It, it did. still does. It still does. does it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Does it? Okay. So, oh. but are are you are you? Um, and I'm not trying to argue that. Sorry if that came across that way. What I'm asking is is that are you better? Are you feeling some? peace within your inner yes. peace and Stacy yes for not feeling like you are the reason oh. for but is there still progress to be had or is there still oh. a road ahead of you yeah. what does that look like because I have no understanding of that um every time the phone rings at our house oh anxiety I my bet. heart stops yeah I bet Oof. I, um I especially a 9 30 phone call yeah 11 o'clock phone call and um Sean to Works for these has worked for these two rehab centers is now working uh, with Epic, but um, he's also working three nights a week as a as a waiter at McCormick and Schmick downtown. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And he calls us every night when he gets off work just to let us know how it went, um, how well he's doing. It's, I mean, the phone calls from him now. Once I know it's him and everything's good, are are. The joys of my their Christmas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Every time he calls, it's mm-hmm. like Christmas. That's awesome. But oh my God, I you know, post traumatic stress, I it, it is so real. And yeah. Stacy Stacy went to a counselor for a while and they tested her and he, the guy told her your post traumatic stress is probably worse than anybody who was affected by something in an accident mm. in war because it's it's something with your child with right. someone in your family. And she was so actively involved in that, those moments, those oh, life-saving abs- yes. moments of, yeah. of the, he was 18, 17, 18 years yeah. old. Yeah. So did he ever have a, a stretch of, um, of being sober before now? He had one six month stretch, which we thought, you know, they always tell you, you know, they're going to be, st- Pratt falls. There's going to be something happen, and and there was with him on several occasions. Um, at the height of his addiction, um, we didn't know where he was for two years. 
We didn't know if he was alive. We didn't know if he was dead. Man, I didn't know that. Yeah. He was working on a crew climbing cell phone towers. And uh, not a good situation to be in. And Did he... Was that was there a falling out between you two that no. he why was there not communication for two years? He he just he wasn't Sean. Um he um we couldn't we just simply couldn't deal with the stress yeah. of one. You know, when he lived at the house, is he coming home? When is he coming home? Is he gonna come home drunk? Yeah. Um he, uh, yeah, it's, you're, you're the mom and dad and it's a little hard to be like, <clears throat> well, I'm going to go to bed now at I, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock and can't. Yeah. You just stay up all night with anxiety wondering, it's horrible. You know, what's, oh, I can't imagine. I mean, I, there were days that, uh, I couldn't get out of bed. I mean, it, I, I, I think deep, I've, I've, I haven't had any counseling, but deep in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, if I don't get out of bed, I don't have to deal with it. Mm-hmm. I, I never missed a day of work. Uh, the only person I told at work about it was our sports editor, just so he would know in case something big happened. Sure. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it, 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 you know, he was on the road with these crews, and he, you know, wasn't living at home. And when, when he was at home, I'd take him at 530 in the morning and meet the crew, and mm-hmm. they might go to Omaha or they might go to uh, Tulsa. Okay. Work on a crew. I mean, these are like, I took him lunch one time when he was working at uh, at one of these cell phone towers in uh, Oak Grove. And I thought, well, where the hell is he? It was so high up, I couldn't even see him on the top of this. Oh, my gosh. And I, I can't climb stairs that have slats where you see. I, I'm <laughs> yeah. freakishly afraid of heights. So We're uh, laughing because there's been times uh, we've all been creeped out of that. Oh, same yeah. 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 Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah. So, uh, Stacy heard about Al-Anon. We went on a Sunday afternoon, mm. and I walk in, and right across from me on the hall was a hand-painted sign of can- done in crayons that says, don't even try changing them. But the C was really faded from sunlight or something, so it looked like it said, don't even try hanging them. <laughs> And I have used that in every time I have ever talked to anybody associated because if I could have hung him and got away with it, I might have done it. Uh, all I did was cry. Yeah. I couldn't say a thing. Um, it was a small group. Uh, there was a, a guy in there. We, we noticed an 18-wheel pickup out in, or drive uh, mobile out in the, in the uh, parking lot. And he came up to me and, and he goes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. I know it's your first time. And he said, I'm always here for you. Hmm. Gave me his cell phone number. Uh, I've never, I never called him. He was I, a truck driver? Truck driver. Okay. And he would schedule his routes to where he could go to an al meeting. Oh, wow. And it was his children, two children that he was dealing with. And I'm like, how did, how can these people even talk? How can they, you know, I, I, I didn't want to go back because I'm like, I'm dealing with all this. I can't breathe most of the time. Mm-hmm. I'm watching my son slowly kill himself. Yeah. And I don't want to hear about other people's problems. Yeah. But when you do keep going back, you're talking to people that know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And that's huge. They know how you feel. Um, one of my best friends would call me, say, hey, I haven't heard from you in a month. I know something's going on. What's up? Talk to him. He goes, I know just how you're feeling. (laughs) No, 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 no. Uh, You've never given your kid CPR on the floor, not knowing where he was for two years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when when he eventually came back home, Sean, um, a lady uh, that worked at a bus station in Omaha had seen him in there, sleeping in there and, and nothing to, you know, sleeping on a duffel bag. And she talked to him and gave him the money for the bus ride home. And when that happened, I said to myself and I, I said to God, if I ever meet anybody that needs help, I'm going to help them. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I don't want to delve off the subject, but two weeks ago, I'm in Grain Valley late at night to interview somebody that's opening a new uh, cornhole 
facility in Green Valley, a kid that graduated from uh, the high school. And I'm sitting in my car, and somebody knocks on the window, and, and it's this young kid. Looked like Sean when he was 21 years old. Hmm. And uh, he goes, I'm, man, I'm struggling. He said, I don't have any money, and I need to get to Independence. And I said, hop in, let's go. All the time I'm thinking, what have I gotten myself yeah. into? But he was awesome. And mm-hmm. when Sean changed, and he doesn't know what happened, and I don't know what happened, but two and a half years ago, I heard about an organization in Independence called the Good Foundation. Uh, if you go to Independence and go to the Inglewood Art District, as you turn off Winter Road into Inglewood there, there's a big two-story older home. That's the headquarters. In there, they've got 20 monitors. They've got people looking at all those monitors. And they're for all the houses where they have the attics that they're trying to help. Mm. Okay. Uh, I called them up. They said, we'd love to help, but uh, you're looking at eight weeks. Well, and, and I don't know if he'd want me to give him credit, but Bob Buckley, a lawyer in Independence, who was mm-hmm. the PA announcer for the William Christman Boys and Girls Basketball Teams. Okay. I sit next to Bob. I've sat next to him for mm-hmm. 10 years, mm-hmm. and he knew about Sean's situation. So I called him. And I I said, Bob, I've heard about this, and and I know you're somewhat involved with it. He goes, uh, what'd they tell you? And I told him, he goes, uh, let me make a phone call. He calls me back in two minutes, and he goes, can you be there tomorrow morning at 8 a.m.? And that's where everything changed for Sean. Wow. Um, You know, the the kid's been dead three times. He's been in a head-on collision. He's been in a hit-and-run collision. Um. And it changed there. Just he says, I'm laying there one night and I'm like, I, I gotta change my life. And within a month, he was the leader of the quadrant where he was living. Mm-hmm. From there, that's where he got the job with Sona Lake as a peer counselor. And the people at Epic, this new really large rehab center that's come into Kansas City, heard about him and he's now working for them. And you know, I was a big fan of Taxi, the TV show. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. They had an episode where Elaine Nardo's son, one of the taxi drivers, wanted a bicycle. And Elaine said, well, if you really want it, it someday will make it happen. And so the next morning they're at breakfast and her little boy says, you know, I prayed to God about getting a bicycle. Well, he didn't, didn't get it for Christmas. And she was devastated. Mm-hmm. And she goes, well, what, what do you think now? And she goes, well, I mean, God answered my prayer. He just said no. Yeah. Well, God said no to us for 16 years. Yeah. Yeah. I hated God. I, I'm like, you know, we never quit going to church, mm-hmm. but. You were really challenged. I, oh, man, was I challenged. And Stacy has the strongest conviction of anyone I know. If there's anyone who needs help, if there's anyone at the church, any function going on, she was the first one to volunteer. And I'm just walking through the motions. Yeah. And, oh, my God, it was brutal. So when you would hear someone say, oh, God will use it, God will make, God will make everything work out for good, right? Because, yep. I mean, that's, that's what the Bible says. And, and it is true. But when God's you're always the, by your side. When you're in the middle of it, oh. unfortunately, those things. Yeah. You'd yeah. probably rather been punched in the gut. Oh, absolutely. Stuff, right? Yeah. I, and, and, you know, I hear it every, every Sunday or, you know, different things. And, yeah. um, but w- when Sean called us from, uh, the good foundation and said, Hey, I'm, I'm done. He said, I'm getting my life turned around. I got a, you know, he has no credit whatsoever. Uh, gosh, his, his credit rating now is up in the 600s. He's got an apartment downtown. Good. Um, has a car. First car he's had since he totaled the one in the head-on collision. He, you know, he didn't have nine lives. He had 90 lives during all this. Um, never got anybody pregnant, which we were so thankful for because mm-hmm. we're, you know, hoping one day he'll have a grandchild and it'll be with somebody he'll spend the rest of his life with. Sure. And I talked at the meeting a couple of weeks ago, and I said, you know, when I come in here, and there are some people that are really struggling, and I said, I feel guilty 
because the light at the end of the tunnel is no longer an oncoming train. It's the light that's surrounding my son and all the good he's doing. Yeah. And I had a guy who's been going to that longer than me. And he goes, I don't ever want to hear that again. I don't ever want to hear you say that you're guilty Mm -hmm. because you're an inspiration to everyone here. And we can all just grasp on to something and realize that good things can happen, even though they aren't happening right now. Yeah. And I've, I've told this story to countless students, athletes, friends in high school. Uh, I've shared it with teachers. Um, I've had people call me and ask me if I'd come talk to somebody, a, a student who's struggling with the wrong decisions. Yeah. And that, that's the greatest compliment anybody can pay me. And I'm, I'm very willing. I'm very open to talk about it. I never hit it, but I'm the type guy that keeps everything bottled up inside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's why like somebody might call me and say, I haven't heard from you in months. I know something bad's happening. Tell me. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the, that's when, you know, who your really good friends are somebody that cares. So 16 years, every day I say a prayer, uh, you know, three years later going on 19 years that, uh, that things are great, but I can close my eyes and, and still see Stacy giving him CPR in the back seat of our car. Right. Um, but do you sleep better now? I do sleep better now, but I, I still deal with it. Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 I'm sure I'm going to have to deal with the rest of my life, but it's not all consuming. Yeah. It's not the first thing I think about when I wake up. It's not the first thing I think about before I go to bed. Yeah. But you know, there are those moments Sure. and, um, he, I mean, Ronnie, come on, man. It took me years to quit biting my fingernails. Mm. This kid, three years has given up opioids, mm-hmm. heroin, everything. Um, and and, and it's, it's a miracle. He is a walking, talking. And he's human. serving others. It, exactly. He's using his testimony to help yes. others. I know, Joe, you had well, a question. I, I was just going to say, so do you feel differently now about Romans 8, 28, or about people saying, oh, yeah, God, God can use it for good. Like, yeah. is that something that you can hear it now and go? I've apologized to God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, well, I totally feel differently. Yeah. Because um, your wife is in now, you said she's working with, what's it called, with the teenagers? Alateen. Alateen. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Um, she, uh, she and Sean have this amazing relationship. Uh, the other day he was out at the house, uh, moving into a new apartment and stayed with us. And it's, uh, you know, we're back from the meeting and, and Sean and Stacy are cooking breakfast, which they used to do all the time. And I'm looking at that and I just started crying. Mm, I'll yeah. bet. I'm like, Oh my God, our Sean, the Sean we knew before mm-hmm. all this is back. Yeah. And, uh, one thing they talk about in Al-Anon is, is separating with love. Not separating with anger or separating with hate, but separating right. with love. Mm-hmm. And I thank God every day that Stacy's still with us because the effect this had on her life was, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer. I can't even mm. tell Put you it what it was like. And to see the person you love most in the world struggling, crying, mm-hmm. desperate, wanting wanting an answer. Um whew. Yeah. Is Al Anon or I, I can't, Al, Alateen? Alateen. <laughs> I don't know why I can't remember yeah. that. That's not that so hard. So those are two different things Alateen and Al Anon, right? There's, okay, there's Alcoholics Anonymous, uh-huh. Al Anon for somebody that you love or somebody in, that you're involved with okay. struggles. Okay. And then Alateen is for the kids. Mm-hmm. I think it's 11 to 19 year olds okay. whose parents, whose parents are addicts. Okay. So are any of those. Um, faith based. Oh, yes. or is is the good foundation faith based? I'm just curious. No, they're all faith based. Because I've heard people that that either have someone in al- I don't th- I don't know if I've known someone personally who's been in Alcoholics Anonymous, but you know you see it in movies and stuff, mm-hmm. and and it seems like faith could be part of the 12 step program in Alcoholics Anonymous. But if someone didn't already have an established faith they might not consider it faith-based is kind of what it has been explained like that. It's kind Absolutely. of yeah. generic. It can be faith-based if you want it to be faith-based, but it's 
doesn't have to be. It's a higher power. Higher power. Okay. Now, uh, even though I was mad at him for 16 years, you know, my higher, higher power was God. Sure. Um, when Sean started, his higher power was just something in the cosmos that is helping him get through this. Mm-hmm. And um, he's now going to church. Mm-hmm. And uh, So did he not believe in God? Do you think I, when he you know, was a teenager? I don't, I don't know because, you know, we raised him in the church. Right, that's, yeah, that's but, what I'm uh, yeah. you know, he and his brother, when they grew up and were out of the house, neither one of them went to church. Mm-hmm. Um, he believes in God now. Mm. Uh, he he goes to church uh, down by the plaza, and um, he leads a group, leads an, Alan, Al, an AA group, I think, on Thursday nights. Mm. Um, he tries to go to three or four meetings a week. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you want to talk about little skinny pencil neck kids. He was one growing up. Mm -hmm. He spends two hours a day in the gym. Good. He's got 24-inch pythons, man. I mean, Hulk Hogan's got, oh, he is buff. He is in such great I have not seen him in so long. I know. I I would love to see him. That's one thing that he never, you know, has felt comfortable around. Is he still holding shame? Is oh that, yeah, you think I, that's what it I, I is? I think so, probably. Just you know, maybe not so much holding shame, but just wondering what people think of him mm-hmm. when they don't know the whole story. And that's right. why it's so cool to tell this story, yeah. because this kid is a rock star. Mm-hmm. I mean, to to beat the addiction, yeah, and to be giving back. He, I mean, to be a counselor and a coach. He called me the other day. Uh, he was called to a hospital. A 68-year-old woman involved in this um, epic, I don't know why I can't remember that, epic recovery. Um, Odeen was in the hospital, and oh he was the person that went and talked to her. Mm-hmm. And uh, he goes, Dad, I just I left, and I've, I've never felt so good. Mm. You know, she listened to me and, you know, I'm going to work with her and we're going to try to, you know, help her get, you know, go through the recovery process Mm -hmm. and get her life back. And he said, I didn't think I would ever have a life again. Um, we have his two dogs because, and I call them rescue dogs because we'd go over there and these poor dogs would be in a one foot by two foot kennel, two little mini dachshunds and, you know, it, it, it's so funny though, when he comes and, and especially when he stays with us, they sleep with him mm. and they go nuts when they see him. Mm. And, uh, it's, uh, you know, man. I, so it, you watch the dogs because he's because busy. of, a, well, no, <clears throat> they're ours. Oh, oh, he's I never get know that. <laughs> I, thought you, yeah. I thought you said they were his dogs. Well, they, they were, and we, you know, with I see, all, all I gotcha. his struggles, mm-hmm. we just took them over. Sure. And, um, but, you know, when he comes to the house and, and the girls see him, they go crazy. So, <laughs> you know, I appreciate, you know, this platform because it's it's tough. Um, not all stories end like this. Yeah. Uh, somebody that's been coming to Al-Anon for years, uh, son committed suicide. And he still comes back because his his message can help people who may have that situation in their household. So, mm. uh, yeah, Al Anon, check it out. It's, it, you know, you just Google it. Uh, they meet basically every day of the week. How do you spell it? A L hyphen A N O N Al Anon. And my gosh, if, if, if a kid's listen, teenagers listening, Al, a teen, A L hyphen A hyphen T E E N. Um, Boy, the first couple of meetings are tough. Yeah. A lot of crying, a lot of hugging. Sure. And I took and dropped Stacy off uh, for the trip down to Tantara with her girls. And when she walked out of that car, they almost knocked her to the ground. They, you know, just, she she's like a mother to them. And uh, one of them is uh, joining Alateen, or is joining, I think she's joining Alcoholics Anonymous uh, because they have some open meetings. And Stacy is going to be her sponsor. Hmm. So it's the first time stacy has been wow. a sponsor for someone. Just amazing. That's so cool. Yeah. I am uh, so grateful 
for you to come in. You know, the thing I heard, there's so much there. I mean, I did whatever happened with me and my struggle is nothing close to what you went through. But the thing that kind of resonated with me and you talked about you feeling it, Stacy feeling it, maybe even some degree Sean feeling it was just that sense of shame, you know, like just somehow you're overwhelmed with shame. And I know that the, the feeling of internal, or I, let me back up the internalizing, the emotion of internalizing all mm-hmm. of that is so destructive. Um, and you don't know the power of community and, and, that, and God pr- promotes community. He actually encourages to be in community. And uh, when you're in community and you have the ability to share with others and open up, then yep. that's when you can get over the shame. And when you can get over the shame, that's the first step to being on the road to recovery or some sort of healing process. And so, um, uh, oh, I, I, I want to interrupt you for, yeah, yeah, please. I never felt shame. I mean, I felt, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought you felt shame breaking disappointment. I got you. I thought you were feeling like Sean, it was your fault. Well, uh, well, and the, and the, I mean, you feeling okay. shame from that in, in regards to that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If, if, yeah absolutely. Uh, that was horrible, mm-hmm. but it's, it's something that I've never not, been open to talking about it because I think if I talk about it, I can help someone. And yeah. today is such a great platform. And you know, in that regard, yes. Yeah. I, I, I that's what I meant. I, shame. And like, how could I be such a horrible father? Yeah. And, um, but it wasn't fair to yourself. Yeah. You know, and oh, that's the I, thing. Anybody who's going through all of that, some they, they're so overcome with yeah. shame in whatever capacity it yeah. might be that it prevents them from understanding that yeah. they that they're not being fair to themselves. Sure. They're absolutely and and perfect. and so in, in a lot of ways, and and I'm not a counselor and I don't understand this, and so I'm probably not gonna vocalize this correctly, but Shane had an illness or Shane, Sean had an illness. And, yep. and, you and know, I didn't know what, right. Well, and he didn't know how to deal and with he, it because it was an illness, right? Like, so, um, I, again, I, Sean, if you're listening to this, come around, dude. Yeah. We miss you. We'd love to see you. I'd love to give you a hug. Um, this podcast is truly intended to be entertaining and offer conversation and, and stories with people who are all walks of life. But again, this podcast was inspired because of something that I went through and it's not about creating a podcast. That's going to make us rich one day. It's truly about the, it's more about the message than the money and using people's testimony and stories to uh, hopefully provide awareness or provide hope for somebody who's going through something um, that is bigger than them. (laughs) And, and, in in a lot of this is stuff that was bigger than us Absolutely. and and it was through the the glory of god and the belief in him that we were able to overcome those things and now i know that i have a new purpose for feeling the need to serve others and the lord blessed me and jillian with the ability to gab <laughs> from our years of being on the radio mm-hmm. and we have a little bit of a following from our time being on the radio and so we get to use the this as a platform to potentially use people's story and testimony like yours and our own to to serve others. And we would not be able to do that without you having the vulnerability to come in here and Sean allowing that to happen. And so I'm great, so grateful for that. Thank you so much. Oh, it, it's been enlightening. Uh, such a pleasure meeting you. Yeah, you too. Hope you know how much I respect you. Thank you. And uh, Thank it, you. It, it's been a, a great experience. We're going to make it worth your time a little bit. We got Brown Piercy Cattle Company, who's one of our sponsors. They're going to hook you up with a guest gift box. You're going to get four premium thick cut steaks, four of their famous steak burgers, two family size roasts, and four pounds of 93% Lean ground beef, if that's all right. If you think oh. if you can handle all that. Can huh? I be Can I be on every week? Hey, come on. <laughs> hey, you're welcome back anytime. Thanks, I know buddy. there's so many other stories that we could have talked about, and maybe we'll get to do it another time. Thank you again so much for coming in. Episode 37 with Bill Althaus. Jillian, thank you so much for being here. Of course. I'm Ronnie Phillips. Until next time, this is the Papa Ron Podcast. You've been listening to the Papa Ron Podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, hit subscribe now on the podcast platform. Follow the Papa Ron Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And while you're there, like, comment, and share. Until next time, thanks for listening to the Papa Ron Podcast. Papa Ron Podcast. Papa Ron Podcast.